my name is Annabelle Abs, and I'm a, a writer, a mum, a blogger, but also a, uh, a very keen long distance hiker. And I uh, currently live in London, but I spend quite a bit of time in Sussex, where my mum lives and uh, um, where my dad did live. He just died recently. So I've been doing a lot of walking because uh, <laughs> I think grief and walking sort of seem to go hand in hand. Uh, so my latest book is called Windswept. I've been writing it for about five years. And basically what happened was a, um, a sort of I've got a, I've got a sort of strange history of, of walking. But I realized that all the books I was uh, reading were all about men, men walking. And so I'm, I'm particularly interested in women who walk uh, long distances and, and sort of grueling. You know, I call it long distance walking or, or hiking or we might call it trekking, I suppose, rather than a, a stroll in the city. And so I'm also very interested in women who go out into quite remote uh I call them sort of unpeopled places where the terrain is often quite hostile. There's often mountains, but also uh, women who follow uh, long river journeys or women who walk across plains or as in not aeroplanes, but, you know, <laughs> very flat sort of desert type landscapes. But I realized that every book I read was was pretty much a story of a man. So quite interested in historical women. And it seemed to me that there that there was um, a real gap if you look at the history of walking, it is the history of men, the history of men walking. And I, ju I just thought it was very strange. There seemed to be no women. And I thought I can't be the only person who likes walking. Of course, now I know there are lots of contemporary women who like to go on distance treks. But it seemed to me that no women in the past had done that. So I started looking around and spending a lot of time in uh, the basements of old libraries and archives and digging up. I mean, hundreds and hundreds of women from the past. But I, saw, I started to see patterns with all these women that at points of crisis or you know, points when they felt lost. I guess some sort of major personal issue in their life, they would just set off. Um, their accounts were often unpublished. I had to go and sort of drag them out of the, the bowels of the British Library. They were often unpublished. They were out of print. They were languishing in the, in the bottoms of uh, obscure libraries or in old bookshops. So I started to sort of pull them all together and and so that was where my story began but also I I in the book I weave through my own history of walking and how it has changed me that was a very long explanation yeah, we, that's what we like we like long explanations this is what we're here to do is to chat and to talk about all things and and just to say I'm, I'm so sorry about the loss of your dad and and dealing with um dealing with that loss were you were you quite a close family growing up were you did you used to go walking with your parents I had a very strange childhood I was brought up in Wales in a very remote village and uh, neither of my parents could drive my dad never learned to drive we never had a car so we had to walk everywhere so walking was very much uh, it was sort of integral to my life really we didn't we, we, we every day we went out walking for a walk but we also had to walk just merely to get anywhere so whenever we wanted to go anywhere we had to walk um but you know we were walking we weren't doing urban walking we were very much walking in nature so we were walking we were walking through valleys and along the coastline and um I, for a long period of my childhood I didn't go to school so walking was also part of my education we would, you know, walk somewhere and then we would draw. This is, this is my parents' idea of schooling. <laughs> we would walk somewhere and then, you know, we would get out our sketchbooks and we would draw. Flowers was my thing. I, I, I think I spent most of my primary years uh, sketching flowers. <laughs> so uh, consequently, I couldn't, I was hopeless at maths and my science was pretty abysmal. I had quite a tricky job catching up when I started secondary school, you know, and I was just, just coming up to the age of 12. And, you know, I, could, I just could barely add up because I'd spent years just writing poems and drawing pictures of flowers. So, I mean, looking back now, it was a rather lovely childhood. But at the time, it made secondary school quite difficult because, you know, they assumed that because I could draw and write, I, you know, I should be in the top set. And I was always, you know, I just couldn't really catch up with the, with the maths because I should really have been in the bottom set. But that was that was how the, the schooling was done. The secondary schooling was done back then but yes so my dad was a, a very keen walker and you know he would he would do things like he would hold up traffic with his walking stick and we would all sort of skip across the road while he shouted death to the motor car and you know, he was very anti-car so that is sort of that sense of uh, walking in wild places is sort of in my blood and that sense that you know a car isn't you know a car isn't necessarily a good thing um, a car 
you know, it was it seems very luxurious to me. Of course, I drive now, but I still would prefer to. I still would always walk if I can. I only get in the car if I absolutely have to. So walking and nature was there. And although, you know, obviously I live in London now, but, you know, I, I really get very twitchy. If I haven't seen some greenery, I get quite twitchy after a few days. So that need for greenery. And, and of course, for a long time, I thought that was just me. But what's been so fascinating in the last the last two decades, really, is the, the amount of research just pouring out of all of these universities, which shows that, and women in particular, really interesting studies that show that women, when women walk in nature, our blood pressure drops even more than if we were male. So, of course, walking in nature is great for blood pressure of men and women, and it's great for you know reducing stress levels, reducing cortisol in men and women. But the uh, results are always more marked in women. So it's as if either we we need it more or it's as if we have some sort of, I would almost say, special connection in that we respond to it very, very immediately and quite dramatically. And yet, if you look back historically, women have so often been confined to to their homes, to their, you know, to their kitchens or, or to wherever their, their place of work. And, you know, at some at some stage, I think probably maybe about four or five hundred years ago, um, the wild landscapes became the preserve of men. So that was the stage at when men were going out and hunting, shooting, fishing, poaching, scaling peaks, surveying, you know, all the things that they were doing. And women who had obviously at that up until that point had lived more sort of a, a more agricultural life, often sort of gardening and in the country. And then you see the Industrial Revolution and, and everyone moves to the cities. And at that point, women really become particularly trapped within the home or within their workplace, mainly within the home. And landscapes empty out, you know, everyone moves to cities and 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 wild landscapes that had once been full of small holdings and small villages and hamlets and and, and small farms suddenly become uh, empty. And at that stage, men seem to sort of move in and take over the landscape for themselves. And suddenly wild places are not deemed safe for women. And this is obviously very topical at the moment. You know, these places are not, are not places of safety and women are encouraged to stay at home or to stay, you know, to have a garden. And the garden is where you you get your contact with nature. Uh, and I studied, yeah, I, I sort of, as I was mulling all this, I just started to feel quite, quite cross. And I started to find out this actually, this was a bit of a myth. And there are, in fact, a lot of women who, um, you know, who, who who took that quite radical decision to step out of their kitchen and to go out back into nature and to do these long, quite reckless in a way quite reckless hikes because what you have to remember is that um, I'm looking really at women about 100 years ago they had no uh, no GPS they had no mobile phone there was no mountain rescue service the kit they traveled with was uh, that they walked with was I mean, just uh, you, you can hardly imagine it now so I came across accounts of women uh, who would walk just with their you know their things in a basket or they would stitch themselves up a sort of uh, a sack and carry it, carry it over their shoulder in some sort of homemade sack. Quite a lot of women who used, made their own tents. Uh, and then if you actually go and some of them obviously did use rucksacks, but if you go and pick up a rucksack from the 1920s, it is so heavy. It's solid. It's canvas. It's leather. The buckles are made of brass. You know, it weighs a ton before they've even put anything in it. Um, so you know, they would they would all the things that we would now have on a little phone. They are, you know, they are packing up. They would take a, a real book and they would take, uh, you know, often they would travel with, they wanted to, you know, draw. So they would take pencils and a sketch pad and, well, we just have our, our phone on our camera. So they often walked with weights that were, you know, weights on their back that were sort of weight that, you know, I, for example, would think, oh, no, no, that's way too heavy. So so the more, the more I came across these women, uh, the more impressed I became. And I started sort of collating them. I've got a huge, huge database of them now. Only only about nine or ten go into the book, and I focus on six of these women. Uh, and I then what I did was when I started getting all these women together, I thought, you know, I'm going to go and do their walks. And at the stage, I was going through a slightly difficult time uh, in that I was, <clears throat> you know, I'd spent a lot of time at home, bringing up my four kids. And I found that quite, you know, I felt quite confined. I felt quite trapped, actually, 
for quite a long time. And it sounds very churlish to say because, it, you know, in some ways, you know, you feel so so lucky to, you know, to have healthy children and, and to be able to stay at home and look after them. But actually, I'd found it really difficult. Um, just that sense of, you know, being well, trapped is the only word I can think of, really, just being trapped all the time. So um, as they started to grow up, actually, I started, I started, we started making them walk. So we said, right, there are no more holidays when my youngest was seven, we said there are no more holidays except walking holidays. That is it. You walk or there's, you know, we, we, we stay home and you go to the park again. So they rather grudgingly all agreed that they would come walking. And it transformed our it transformed our family life. And we're now a we're a very close family. And I'm not sure we would have been so close if we had been doing more, uh, you know, perhaps you know, hanging around by a pool or, or whatever. There's something about walking day after day after day, you know, 20, 30, 35 kilometers a day, just, and there's something about that rhythm, you know, you just get into this sort of uh, strange, almost meditative state. And if you're walking as a group, you know, you share this experience, not just the experience, obviously, of the, of the sort of slightly meditative, slightly, um, I call it almost a slightly spiritual state, really. But you also you're just sharing all these experiences. So from the minute you leave, uh, from the minute you start walking at uh, dawn, sometimes you know, everything throughout the whole day is shared in a way that it wouldn't be if we'd gone on a, you know, one of those, I don't know, an activity holiday where you all go off and do different things. So so we sort of really bonded as a family over the walking. And when I started researching these women, and I started going out in their footsteps, I, I suddenly realized that actually my children had grown up and we were coming to the end of that. And and I was sort of looking at a new future. I was looking at a future that didn't, uh, that in which I wasn't a mum, that didn't include uh, children. And I thought, you know, I'm going to have to go out walking on my own, just like all these women did. So I plotted out, I plotted out their routes and I look at, um, I look at George O'Keefe, the, the American artist, famous for her you know, huge, huge flowers. I looked at Gwen John, a Welsh artist. Uh, I looked at Simone de Beauvoir, a philosopher. I looked at the Scottish writer, Nan Shepherd, And then I looked at a, a couple of other women, uh, the wife of a writer called Frida Lawrence. And I looked also at uh, Emma Gatewood, the long distance uh, American hiker who came out of a very, very abusive marriage. Uh, I think she'd had something like I can't remember, there were seven or eight children and a very uh, uh, a horrible, abusive marriage. And she just walked out of her house one day, said, I'm going for a walk. And she went off and she was the first woman to solo hike the Appalachian Trail. So, so I looked at these women and I looked at the predicament that uh, catapulted them into going going on these hikes. Because generally, generally, if you if you go sort of go back 100 years, most women didn't just think, right, I'm going to do this trail. It's not like today where, you know, there are thousands of us, thank goodness, you know, thinking I'm going to do this trail. I've got this coming up and I, oh, I've got the, I can take these months out. And, you know, we often go for adventure. These women were going because they were propelled into going by usually by some sort of emotional, I guess, some sort of emotional turmoil in their lives. Because you had to, you almost had to have that incentive then, because it, it wasn't like it is now. There weren't organised trails, a lot of the routes weren't signposted, so it was a very, very different walking experience. And in fact, following in their footsteps, although I was doing it obviously with a with a mobile phone and a lightweight backpack and everything, following in their footsteps was really interesting because I kept having to say, okay, they did this walk with no phone. They did this this walk. You know, Simone de Beauvoir always walked in or quite often walked in espadrilles for years. She just walked in espadrilles with this basket. So I think, okay, you know, I've got my hiking boots on, my, you know, beautiful, lovely, expensive hiking boots. But, you know, she's doing this in a pair of espadrilles and they're doing it without bras. They're doing it with uh, with coats that don't, that aren't waterproof. You know, so I had to keep sort of trying to get into their, get into, into their skin, if you like, so that I could see, just what they experienced when they when they did those walks. You talked about wanting to 
do their walks you, you you know you found these incredible women who've gone out to, to do these walks tell me more about that experience for you you know doing the plotting doing the planning figuring out the routes um you know how did that all work for you and how did you incorporate your writing were you taking you know a journal with you so that you could write while you walked but did you plan that to be part of your day so you'd start by writing every morning or stop on top of the hills yeah. to write yeah so I always took a always took a journal and um or a notebook and, and kept notes and I also did actually take a, a sketch you know a little sketch pad and a little set of watercolors so I always tried to uh, do sort of paintings and drawings and along the way I tried to use um old maps so I tried to use the maps they would have used rather than just you know looking looking on my looking on my all trails <laughs> and I tried also to um you know, I tried to I tried to walk at the same time. So if uh, so, so Gwen John, the Welsh artist, you know, she sets off in August. So I set off in August. So I, was, I tried to map the time of year that I was walking to the time of year when they walked. So if they were walking in snow, I was also walking in snow. And if they were walking at autumn, I was always also walking at autumn. Best manifesto, really, the second sex. And she talks about um, she talks about you know, women first. She said women first become liberated when they can read a map. And she was a huge advocate of being able to navigate. So women women have to be able to plot out a route on a map. Once you can plot out a route on a map, all by yourself without asking a man, um, then that is the fir- you know one of the first steps in in freeing yourself and becoming a, a sort of a more liberated woman. And uh, Nan Shepherd said sort of similar things not with the same feminist term but she says similar things about uh, walking in scotland she said you know you've got to be you and only you are responsible for your safety you cannot blame anyone else and it's all down to you so you must know how to navigate you must know how to read a compass you must know how to uh, read a map you know you must know a, a little uh, some of the basics of being out in the wilderness so that was a, a really important place to start although i have to say some of the women whose uh, journeys I followed I don't I think they just they just sort of just set off um they didn't necessarily I don't think they always went with compasses so river journeys were quite popular and coastal routes because as a, a woman who's feeling slightly I suppose unsure of your own ability to navigate or concerned about getting lost following a river or following a coastal path is a very easy way it's a good a really good first step it's not quite so difficult to get lost um, and also, if you follow a, a, a river from you know, from its source, you're going you're going downhill. So that was also uh, sort of slightly slightly less demanding. So one of the women I looked at, she did a, a river journey. She was 67, and she followed the Rhone from you know from its first trickle right out to in, in Switzerland, right out to the south of France. Uh, and I thought that it was a great walk for a 67 year old to do. Um, I don't know how relevant it is, but obviously, you know, navigation, navigation skills and map reading and that part of the brain has been linked quite recently to um, Alzheimer's and dementia, which, again, is a something that afflicts many, many more women than men. So I see navigating and, and learning to map read. I see it as, you know, something else that uh, the women need to be doing to ensure that we stay mentally as, as fit and healthy as possible. So, so put away the phone and, and get out a proper map. To learn, learn to follow those contours is what I would say. Yeah. That's absolutely fascinating. I didn't even know that women were more prone to, to Alzheimer's than, than men. And then talking about, you know, the walks that you were going on, you know, following in the footsteps, you know, trying to get the same time of year using your, your old map, your paper maps. What was the, the biggest challenge that you faced while you were out on these walks? Do you know, for me, it was doing them on my own. So my big sort of revelation from doing this was you know, how how wonderful it is to how wonderful it is to be able to walk on your own without feeling afraid. And I had assumed, I think rightly, uh, well, no, no, actually, I think I had assumed wrongly that you know going out and hiking on your own, I had been frightened of that. I'd always, always, always wanted to do it, and I'd always been too frightened. Uh, all the way through, you know, growing up, I would always make a boyfriend come with me because I, you know, I, I did lots of hiking all the way through. I spent three months hiking through the Himalayas when I was about 21 and, you know, in the way far north of the Himalayas where no one else goes. But again, you know, I went I went with a boyfriend 
And I nearly always had taken someone with me. Or, or of course, latterly, I, my whole family had come. So I'd always walked, done these long distance walks with other people. And I had never done it on my own. And so many of the women that I was researching went off on their own. And they, they walked at night on their own. They walked through, you know, uh, quite dangerous landscapes on their own. As I said earlier, they walked without any of the technology that we have. So they were really more at risk, I think, than, than we are today. You know, I thought, OK, I'm going to have to do it on my own. I'm going to have to walk 10 days, day after day on my own. And I was nervous about that. I thought, you know, what, what happens? Because, again, I'm, these aren't 10 days walking through cities where there are lots of people. These are 10 days walking through areas where you don't really see many people. So I thought, you know, what happens if I break an ankle? What happens if I you know, fall in the river? You know, what, what could happen? What happens if I, if I, you know, I get assaulted? You know, all these things that women walk with. And this is one of the things I look at in quite a lot of detail in my book is, is how much complexity women walk with. You know, a man just thinks, oh, do you know what? I fancy an adventure. <laughs> he puts on his backpack and off he goes. Now, it's so much more complicated for a woman, particularly in the past. But even today, I think, you know, we think, OK, how much can I carry for starters? Because we're, we're not always uh, as strong. We then think, am I going to be safe? Uh, is this route safe? You know, we might even sort of Google, have there been many rapes on this route? Again, you know, men never worry about that. We also have to think about, you know, your period starting, uh, cramps, you know, and you have to take take things and think, well, OK, how am I going to handle that? You have to think about, you know, am I going to arrive somewhere at night before it's dark? You know, how, how long is that route? So, you know, there's just so much additional complexity, even as we're thinking, God, can we can I navigate over that mountain, you know, just with a map? And, you know, when you read accounts of the, the famous male walkers, and there are many, many accounts of people like Robert Louis Stevenson and Laurie Lee, and, and, you know, they just set off. They just set off with a, whatever, a few raisins and, and a knife or a gun or and off they go. Uh, and they don't have any of this, I think, sort of uh, mental baggage that we have to deal with before, you know, that's before we go. And so for me, doing these walks, I was a very... Yeah, acutely aware that I was by myself. And that was a new thing for me. And a lot of when I got back, you know, a lot of my friends, you know, their first questions were, you know, did you meet dodgy men? Were you lonely? Did you miss your family? So there are a lot of a lot of sort of expectations on us, I think. It felt quite strange to come back and say, actually, do you know, I didn't miss my family at all. <laughs> I had a wonderful time because that you know, feels slightly disloyal. But I thought, you know what, I'm just going to I'm, I'm going to be honest about this. And uh, I wasn't lonely at all. And I absolutely loved it. Because when you walk on your own, and you probably know this, Sarah, there's a big difference between walking on your own and walking with one friend and walking with a group. They're all very different experiences. And, you know, I love walking with a friend. And sometimes I love walking in a group. But I didn't know if I was going to love walking on my own. I thought I might not. Um, I thought I might be, you know, <laughs> I might be either bored or I might be scared. And I was a bit scared, but I was never, ever bored. And that was a, a revelation. That's probably the biggest thing I learned was that when you walk on your own, the landscape is a, is a very different place. And you engage more deeply, I think, with the with the wildlife, but partly because you're just much quieter. So walking with a bunch of kids, you never see any wildlife. You know, you say so you engage with the landscape differently. You look around more because you're not having to make conversation or think about conversation or think about anyone else or make decisions about do we, you know, sort of conversations that you would have with a walking group or a walking partner is, you know, where do we turn here? Should we go that way? Should we stop for lunch now or should we stop later? All those little decisions. You just don't have to think about them. So it takes away a whole layer of stuff to think about. It's all just taken away. Uh, and you're really just you're just walking with the landscape and you're walking with the river or you're walking with the mountain. And it means that you develop, I felt, you you develop a, a completely new awareness of the landscape. And it's quite interesting because as two of the women, at least two of the women I write about, you know, they they finish up their lives. They are single at the end of their lives. And they say their most important relationship has been with a mountain, not with a man or a woman or the kids or anything. Actually, those two didn't have kids. But, you know, that was the defining relationship of their life was with a mountain. And so it might sound slightly strange, but I that I really started to understand that. And I think um, women women who who have walked on their own for you know day after day after day that will resonate. Uh, it's a, it's a very different experience, and I would really I would really recommend it. So that was that was for me the the big hurdle 
bigger than you know the other things you can prepare for so the backpack you know I was just doing lots of weightlifting and I was doing you know lots of physical exercise that's quite straightforward but preparing for things in your head is much more complicated and you can't really you can't really do it apart from perhaps taking a few you know I started taking walks on my own I used to always walk my dog and then my dog died and I thought okay I could get another dog but actually I thought actually do you know see if you can do this on your own and I was quite amazed at countries where I, I walked on my own and people stopped me all the time to say are you on your own and you know, people were surprised by this and I was like yes I'm on my own and a lot of people were like but why don't you have any friends or <laughs> why are you on your own so particularly in France you know, I got a lot of questions you know why are you on your own but people just thought uh, one one man for example I get a write about this but one man was like well, well, you you must you must be you divorced, obviously. So I said, no, I, I, actually, I have a husband, and he was like, well, where is he? I said, well, he's at home. <laughs> you know, he doesn't come everywhere I go. <laughs> and he was he was really surprised by that. And in fact, in the end, in some countries, I started to say, you know, because people were so surprised, I got all these questions, and I thought, you know, I'm just a bit tired of answering these questions about why well, I'm on my own, and it's not because I'm weird, and <laughs> it's not because I'm divorced, or <laughs> it's not because I've got no friends. <laughs> you know I started to say oh I'm on a sort of pilgrimage and in a way I was I was on a sort of pilgrimage I was sort of in a, in a pilgrimage in, in these the footsteps of these women but people were always much happier when I said I said you would say oh just be pilgrim and they were like ah okay because there's a very very long history of of women doing pilgrimages often on their own so there was there was a a sense of you know that sort of made sense whereas a woman walking around on her own with a backpack often didn't make sense which I think is starting to change, but mainly on the, the trail. So if you do a, a sort of a, a well-known trail, you know, people are much more used to seeing a woman on her own. But if you are just sort of walking around or following a river and it's not a famous big trail, then you really don't see many women walking on their own still. Yeah. Uh, and I hope that I hope that starts to change. And obviously, with some of the, the news recently about women being attacked, I really worry that that is going to sort of set us back again because you know every time that happens and, and we all feel it I feel it. I think oh god perhaps I shouldn't be doing this you know perhaps it's dangerous and you know women have worked so hard over the the last century particularly over the last century to fight these fears and to try and reclaim these wild places and you know I, I want that to continue I want we, we need to see more women out there walking you know either on their own or with another woman um, because that that is how we will all start to feel feel safer out there and I love it to be a stage where any woman can just think oh you know I've got a weekend free I'm just going to put on a backpack and I'm just gonna yeah maybe I'll follow this river or I'll maybe I'll go and do that coastal path or maybe I'll go into the mountains um, but I think think and I don't know what you think Sarah but my feeling is that there are still only quite a small number of women who would feel comfortable doing that what, what do you think? Oh, I, I think you've hit the nail on the head I think there's so many added complexities about women when they when they walk and hike and everything that you listed is stuff that I that I know that I do in terms of the planning and the preparation and figuring out well how would I get there am I safe what time of what time of day would I arrive what time do I need to start what time do I need to finish there's there's things that sort of men just do not need to even consider or think about I know when I look at doing certain trails safety is one of my paramount concerns because I'm also very aware that it's my you know my responsibility to look after myself when I put myself in these situations and I was having a conversation with somebody recently and I was telling him about a couple of the hikes I wanted to do UK hikes like you know for example heading down to do the South Downs Way 100 mile national trail in the UK and he was like oh you you do it by yourself <laughs> I don't think he necessarily knew some of the, the trails I'd done and I was sort of like yes and then it was that whole are you not scared? Are you not fearful? And and to be fair, like part of me was I wanted to have a real rant, but I realised that it it wasn't to, it was nothing to do with him. It was more a case of me just having me just sort of thinking, yes, I'm feeling scared, but I shouldn't feel scared because if men didn't attack women, then women would have this freedom to to travel and the responsibility of our safety is always on women like women don't go out at night don't women don't walk here don't go there don't do this and it limits our freedom and it li oh, like I could I'm 
raging. Anyway, <laughs> um, but no, I, I think that the fact is it's very valid, very, very valid points about it. And I think there are there are smaller sections of the population who, and it's maybe not even about confidence or, or having the skills or the mindset, but it is, you know, it's stepping outside your comfort zone. And it also depends on, on your upbringing, on your privilege, you know, whether or not you you had access to things like Duke of Edinburgh Award, how close you are to the mountains, how comfortable you feel in the in the outdoors, um, and you know the color of your skin as well. You know, as a white woman, I know that I'm afforded more privilege than than black women and brown women who head out into the mountains, and so I think there's all of these things to to take on board, uh, and I think one of the interesting things you talked about it when you go solo. One of the things that I personally enjoyed for me when I was on the Appalachian Trail was this amazing quality thinking time to really, you know, to try to do some like, like deep reflection and really deep work within myself. And, but I also think that thinking time and being alone with your own thoughts, as empowering as it can be, can also be very scary because sometimes you don't want to reflect on things that have happened in your past and analyze what's what's gone gone on. No matter whether that's ugh, I don't, you know you don't want to rate like different levels of trauma, but um, you know to actually think, reflect, um, process. And sometimes people aren't necessarily ready for that, and that can be very. Um, intimidating to be in a wild open space alone with thoughts which can be very dark that's right with yourself yeah Yeah. so true (laughs) that's very very true um but I think also the other side of that coin is that if you then you sometimes you need to be with those parts of yourself don't you Mm. and you need to you need that reflection time so after my after my dad died I did I did quite a lot of bits of the South Downs way actually which I I really recommend and do you know what Sarah you always feel safe nearly always feel safe on the South Downs and one of the things I discovered with uh, following in the footsteps of these women was that actually they chose their landscapes quite carefully so somewhere like the South Downs it's very open and it's quite exposed so you can see someone coming towards you from quite a long way away it's very very unlike walking in a forest for instance And one of the walks I did was I went to Texas. So Georgia O'Keeffe, the artist, she started walking along around on the Texas plains. And I've never been to Texas. I've never walked anywhere that was, you know, that was as vast as that grey, open, wild space. And I was quite I was quite nervous about that because there's nothing there's nothing there. There's no trees. There's no hedges. It's it's not like England or or Europe at all. It's not even sort of mountain. I mean, it's not even like the mountains in that. It's bleak, but it's just flat and sky. And and she often walked. She went out and walked at night. And I was I was like, wow, gosh, that's so brave. You know, she'd go on these long night hikes on her own. And I thought, well, I'm going to have to do that to, you know, for, for the sake of authenticity, I've, I've got to do that. And I arrived in Texas and it was just like no landscape I'd ever been in. And I thought, OK, you know, I, I've just got to do it. I've got to do it. So I, I fortunately I had terrible jet lag. So I would go out on the plains um, in the night because I couldn't sleep. And I felt so completely safe there. It was it was a sort of a revelation, really, how safe I felt. And I realized and she kept writing in her all her letters. She kept saying, yeah, this, I, I feel completely safe here because there's nothing here. There's nothing here. You know, I can see a change of weather five days before it arrives. And it's true. You can just see for miles and miles and miles. And because there is nothing there, you feel really safe. You can also hear you can hear the sounds you know, travel across these this sort of flat landscape and you can hear them from such a long way away and you can tell it's a long way away because it's sort of it's quite quiet and you can just our ears just seem to be able to recognize whether something is close or a long way away so again you feel safe because you you hear the coyote and you you know that's coming from quite a long you know several miles away so you don't feel that it's sort of snapping at your heels and the other women I think also would choose very open landscapes and there was only one woman who sort of liked walking in, in forests. And even she didn't do that very often. But one of my as challenges I set myself was to walk, to try and walk. I was staying in France, to try and walk in uh, a French French forests where she had walked and to do it at night. Well, not at night, but certainly as it was getting dark. I didn't go out at midnight, but I think I was. it was November. So it was quite dark. I was walking about six or seven. And it took me quite a long time to get used to that. And I was absolutely terrified. Um, because there's something about forests, <laughs> there's something about forests, you know, going back to female safety, is you can't see, 
you don't know you can't see anything you don't know who's behind a tree but on the south downs on especially up in the Cairngorms where where I walked in Nan Shepherd's footsteps it's very very open and I always felt safer in that open open landscape than in you know little twisty paths and you know lots of trees and valleys and and woods so again I would probably yeah I would I would say I, I, I think I think most of these women sort of knew that they knew what landscapes to to walk in instinctively yeah um, I, I do remember when I was on um on the Appalachian Trail and I was having to do some night hiking and towards the end, I just, I, I hated it towards, to honest, towards the end, because especially because I was following these white blazers and I was walking through this very dense forest where there was white blazers on the trees. And I thought I was focusing and concentrating, but everything is so different in the dark. And I remember I lost the blaze and I had to stop and all, I was looking around with my pathetic headlight of a torch or like using my iPhone torch. And I couldn't see a blaze anywhere. And I was literally like, oh, my God, have I just walked off the path? Am I now stranded? And it was one of those ones where it's like, right, deep breaths, slow down, turn around. It's like pine needly forest, walk back, keep walking back, 10 steps, look, find a blaze, like find any white mark on a tree, found, you know, found one blaze, had to stop at that blaze then find the next blaze and be like okay right you can walk the 10 meters to that one to get myself out of that forest and like I could feel my stress rising because you know it's the pressure like a I was under a lot of time pressure because this was like the day I think this was like day 98 or day 99 I'd already worked walked like 30 odd miles that day and so it was like it's late it's tired I'm physically exhausted and I don't want to make a mistake a because I don't want to redo any of my steps but one thing that I found interesting is definitely after the Appalachian Trail I started to feel a lot more claustrophobic being when I was just being surrounded by trees all the time I actually craved open outdoor space where I could see more um, and it's definitely something that's that influenced me for for a couple of years in terms of what I chose to do and in terms of not being in a green tunnel or not being in forests or being covered up I definitely needed that that open space I mean when did you finish writing the book well, I finished doing the walking literally a week before lockdown, thank God, because I had to travel all over the place. And then I finished writing it about August or September, autumn, autumn last year, I was sort of doing the final edits to it. I mean, reflecting back now on the book, which I, you know, I think is just incredible what you've done with Windswept. I think, you know, women's, women's stories are just so important to be shared, you know, whether through the through audio or through through film or, or through the written word it's so so powerful you know reflecting back on on windswept and you know walking in the footsteps of remarkable women what do you think's been the the biggest sort of lesson for you the biggest takeaway i think that one of the the problems for women is that we haven't had a legacy we haven't been able to look back and think oh gosh women have been doing this for years so therefore I can. We have always felt as though we are pioneers and having to, you know, having to go first, but actually because they because these women have been erased from history, completely wiped out. And I think it's hugely empowering. I think if I had known maybe, th- so 30 or 40 years uh, ago, you know, when I was, uh, well, actually that wasn't that long ago, it was about, about, about 30 years ago when I was really, you know, I been through a really tough time and I, I really desperately wanted to walk on my own to to reflect really and to sort of try and understand you know what had happened and, and to work out where to go next you know it was one of those sort of early 20s crises and that was a stage when I you know I, I had to take the boyfriend with me because I was too scared to go on my own but I think if I had known that all of these women before me hundreds of years before me had gone off just taken off and walked through the Pyrenees and walked over the Himalayas and you know climbed mountains and if I had known about them I would perhaps have found I like to think I would have found the courage to 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 do it to do something on my own but because all the books were about men climbing mountains and men walking across Europe and men you know doing these great trails you start to learn don't you that this is something that men do 
and you start to learn that this is not your place you know those messages are just going in very very softly very very discreetly not your place <laughs> you know not your thing got to take a man with you and I think that I would instead of you know finding the courage you know sort of halfway through my life I would have found the courage uh, like you have Sarah sort of much earlier on and I could have packed in many more years of uh, advent- of, you know, of just feeling freer and having more adventures so so I guess my takeaway is that we have to resurrect these all of these women, and it's, ha- it's, it's happening quite a lot with mount, you know, with mountaineering, as you, as I'm sure you know. There are, um, I know it was great hearing about Nellie Bly. So we're starting to learn more about these women, but there are still so many more who've been completely forgotten, and I think they need to be pulled out of the woodwork. And you know, I, I look at several of them, but there's a lot more work to be done. I know there are a lot of women now doing this and also writing away, and there are there'll be many more books coming out. Um, and I know, you know, I heard your podcast on Wanderers. Kerry Andrews has done a great job, but there are many more women and we just need to start recognising them, putting them back on the stage. And, you know, all that literature of the leg, as it's called, which is about male adventures, male hiking adventures, just needs to be rewritten. They need to take out half the men and replace them. Now that we know who these women are, there needs to be a balance so that every woman reading about the history of women walking sees that women have always found the the courage and the audacity to to do it and therefore that gives us permission to do it legacy is so powerful because it all you know it almost makes me upset that this is these are the thoughts that that you've been having and and I think back to even in my early 30s that I just didn't know like I just did that you know it's that it's that constant uh subliminal messaging with you know through history through the books that you see through the films that you watch through who gets exposure on the mainstream media who you hear on the radio who gets the films made about them you know who gets their stories shared which voices are propelled forward which ones are silenced which ones are ignored which ones are hidden and I just keep thinking I just want to do so much more like just to more voices more stories and like you say there's there's so many more women doing this now, whether it's through their blogging, through sharing on their social media, through starting podcasts. And it's all so powerful because it needs this roar or this upswell of voices because I I just don't want my little niece, who's like f- five years old at the moment, to turn, you know, 20 or 30 and to be in a similar situation to me and not knowing. Like I want her growing up being surrounded by this and not just her, but other little girls and little boys who are who are growing up it's like the legacy has to has to change and Annabelle where's the best place for people to find more information about you to find out more about your books um the writing that that you do I know you also do like essays and articles and fingers crossed also you know future events where should they find you oh well I have a website which is www.annabelleabs.com or you can just sort of google Oh, I know I'm on uh, Instagram and uh, Twitter uh, and Facebook, or you can just Google windswept and hopefully the details of the book and events will crop up, I hope. Annabelle, thank you so much for coming on the Tough podcast and sharing more about the work that you're doing, more about your walking and windswept. And I'd love for you to have the final words of advice, you know, final advice for women out there who, to be honest, want to get windswept, want to have the wind blowing in their hair. They want to have that, that freedom to to go and hike and to go and hike solo what would be your advice what would be your top tips uh learn to read a map if you i mean if you don't and not everyone has done i didn't do duke of edinburgh not everyone has done duke of edinburgh so learn to read a map learn to navigate uh you can do really straightforward courses uh, or follow a river or a, a coast and just you know just start start by doing like a full day maybe doing trying to do sort of i don't know 15 Maybe start by doing a 15, a one day, 15 miles on your own where you just walk all day and, and, and then take it from there. But, you know, don't please don't be frightened. There's, there's really it's really pretty mainly pretty safe out there in the wilds. I think the key thing you just said that is start by doing 
because that is that is the only way that you can start is by actually taking that first step so start by doing so Annabelle thank you so much for coming on the Tough Girl podcast and sharing more about your life and your journey and, and what you've been doing I really do appreciate everything that you've put into to Windswept and I hope the women and men listening will buy copies of your book read it share it promote it and encourage more women to to get out there and to experience the, this wonderful world that we live in Thank you, Sarah. And I think you're doing a fantastic job too. So keep going. It's, uh, you're, you're, making, you're making the new legacy. You really are. It's so important. Hey Tribe, I hope you enjoyed that conversation with Annabelle. What a conversation, what a woman, what a book and what a passion for writing about women who enjoy walking and spending time in the outdoors. So if you're brand new to the Tough Girl podcast, my name is Sarah Williams. I'm the host of the Tough Girl podcast and the founder of Tough Girl Challenges, which is all about motivating, inspiring you while also increasing the amount of female role models in the media. So everything that we have talked about today will be available in the show notes at toughgirlchallenges.com. So please do go and check it out. Now, I just want to highlight a few other episodes which I think would add a lot of value, especially if you're interested in in walking and historic women figures. So one of the women that Annabelle talked about was Dr. Kerry Andrews, who is the author of Wanderers, A History of Women Walking. So we spoke to Dr. Kerry Andrews on November 5th, 2020. And Kerry is a senior lecturer, lecturer in English literature at Edge Hill University. She writes about literary history, particularly untold or forgotten histories and has published widely on women's writing. She's traced the footsteps of 10 women walkers from an 18th century Parsons daughter, Elizabeth Carter, who desired nothing more than to be taken for a vagabond in the wilds of southern England to modern walker writers such as Nan Shepherd and Cheryl Strayed. Wanderers offers a beguiling alternative view of the history of walking, so well worth checking out. Uh, a future episode that we have coming out on December 2nd is with Rosemary J. Brown, who is a London-based journalist and author. She's an avid traveller, she's a fellow of the Royal Geographic. Society and a Churchill Fellow. Her quest has been to put female adventurers back on the map. She's spoken at the Globe Trotters Club, Women of the World Festival, Women's Institutes and Schools. She's helped to organise the first Heritage of Women in Exploration Conference at the Royal Geographical Society. And recently, her most recent book is Following Nellie Bly. Rosemary shares more about that adventure, shares more about Nellie, and it's an absolutely fascinating interview. So that episode's coming out on December 2nd. A few weeks ago, we spoke with Elise Wortley, who is from Women With Altitude, her website, womenwithaltitude.com. And what she does is brings to life the incredible lost histories of female adventurers by literally walking in their footsteps, using only what was available to them at the time. So, you know, similar to what we've talked about today, you know, throughout history, female adventurers have been overshadowed by their male counterparts. The projects that that Elise has been working on highlights these groundbreaking women's stories and achievements with the hope to inspire women and girls today. So it's again a truly, truly fascinating episode, especially when she recreates their journey wearing the old clothes. We find out how she got their equipment, the research that she did, and also you know, doing these adventures and challenges with no modern expedition equipment whatsoever. So she's recreated two journeys so far and she is planning the third. Again, absolutely fascinating. And that episode came out on the 4th of November so yeah I mean to be honest all of the episodes of the Tough Girl podcast are fascinating and inspiring so please do go and check them out there's over 450 episodes in the back catalogue so if you are completely brand new then oh my goodness get listening make sure you hit that subscribe button so you don't miss out going forward there are going to be regular episodes coming out on a Tuesday and Thursday at 7am UK time so a massive thank you to everybody who has been listening I really do appreciate your support and a massive thank you to everyone who's signed up as a patron so Annabelle Abs, who who I just um, spoke with really believed in the mission and what I'm doing and about creating this you know this legacy that we talked about at the end and she signed up as a patron after our conversation which was just so so awesome it's always amazing to have people believe in you and then to follow it up with action so if you'd like to support the Tough Girl podcast to support the mission to increase the amount of female role models in the media then please do go and visit patreon p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com forward slash tough girl podcast 
and you can sign up. There's a whole variety of different tiers. There is a monthly option. There's also an annual option. Don't worry about the currency because you can support in sterling, US dollars, euros, Australian dollars. Um, your currency will be there. So please do go check out patreon.com. But many thanks again for taking the time out to listen to the Tough Girl podcast. I really appreciate it. If you could tell one friend about it, I would be very, very grateful. But wherever you are, whatever you are doing, give it your all, give it 110%, get after it, go for it, believe in yourself because I believe in you. Take care, lots of love, and I will speak to you soon. Bye.